uh, some quick announcements. Uh, uh, there will be, uh, we have posted another supplementary video. Uh, this is for derivation. I will mention that today a few times. Uh, that is already posted on Canvas, and the lecture notes are for, for that video are also posted. Just a reminder, it's also on a schedule that there is no lecture on Wednesday. Uh, we'll have a makeup lecture the following week, so there is no lecture on Wednesday. And because of the Labor Day, we will not have a class on Monday. So we'll meet after today. We'll meet directly on the 7th, uh, but 7th is also your homework due date, so we'll recognize that. So we'll have we will have office hours on Friday and then again on Wednesday. So there will be two office hours for Tuesday. I'll have office hours today. So in case you have questions, you want to clarify any concepts. And I'll also have office hours on the day of homework, but it's due. So you'll have plenty of time to ask questions. In, in case you have uh, other questions in the meantime, you can always email us and we'll promptly respond. Okay. When you email, just make sure you're copying both of us so that you know. If one of us is busy, we can just answer the questions. The other person can answer the question. Okay. So hopefully that's clear. Uh, so just yeah, no lecture on Wednesday. We'll meet uh, on the seventh of September after this. And there's always a break whenever you have any labor day. There's always a break from classes. So don't forget transport till next week. Okay. Uh, any questions for the homework or supplementary video or anything like that? Announcements? Yes, please. Uh, so for Felipe, it's 3 30, uh, sorry, 3 p.m., 3 to 4 p.m. this Friday. Or, sorry? 3 30 p.m. on this Friday. Uh, we'll also send another reminder on Canvas website. So just so that in case you want to come on Friday. And then on Wednesday, I think Felipe, it's 3 to 5. Yeah. So Felipe will have 3 to 5 p.m. on 7th of September. Uh, and basically, I'll be available until 3 p.m. after the lecture ends. So I'll also have plenty of time. You can ask questions and um, we'll try to give you as much time as possible. Yes. For Felipe's office hours? Yes. Uh, what time do you have it? Three to five. Okay. So we can we can move the office hours. We can just move it later. Time. Yeah. That should not be a problem. Yeah. Thanks for letting us know. Any other questions? We will uh, we'll post on uh, on Canvas and update it. Make sure it's five to seven or something like that. But we'll give, make sure it's not on, on 15. And then anything else? Any other questions? All good. All right, perfect. Let's get started for today. Uh, so just quickly, let's recap what we were discussing um, the last two lectures. So we started the course by talking about heat conduction and how heat flux is minus K grad T, where K is the thermal conductivity and it's a gradient of temperature. Then we spent a bunch of time last class talking about, you know, uh, mass average velocity, molar average velocity, and how uh, the flux J i is equal to minus D i grad C i is only true for constant true and pseudo binary. In case you have different kinds, if you can't make that assumption, remember we discussed three cases, binary constant density, binary constant concentration, and so on. Okay, so just remember that whenever you are using mass, uh, mass diffusive flux or molar diffusive flux, you have to remember about assumptions. We briefly mentioned about the shear stress. Uh, and how like this uh, new grad, new del V, uh, and we'll discuss this more in the second part of the course, okay? Uh, then for another 10, 15 minutes in the last lecture, we discussed uh, different transport rates. We discussed the Prandtl number, which was the ratio of viscous to thermal. And remember we had de de defined uh, mu, mu as mu by rho, which was the momentum diffusivity. And we had defined alpha as K by rho CP which was the thermal diffusivity, okay? So we discussed how it, the parental number is mu by alpha. So let me, I think it's blocking your screen. Yes, yeah, it should be fine. Mu is mu by rho, and then alpha is k by rho cp. So it's viscous diffusivity by thermal diffusivity. And Schmidt number is mu by DAB, or which is viscous uh, diffusivity by species diffusivity. And then Lewis number was the ratio of Schmidt number and parental number. And it turns out to be thermal diffusivity by diffusive, diffusion diffusivity. And we discuss that these numbers are about approximately one for gases and discuss different ranges for liquids and polymers. All right. So this was just a brief discussion on different transport rates. Then finally, uh, we started discussing about conservation equations and we didn't finish the derivation, which is what I will do today. So a quick mistake, which Philippe noted. So thanks to Philippe for pointing that out. I wrote constitutive equations. It's actually conservation equations. The above equations that you see, these three are actually constitutive equations. What we are deriving now today are conservation equations. Okay, so just make sure you correct that in your notes. Uh, then uh, we discussed that if I will define a scalar B, so this is not a B vector, this is just B, a scalar B, okay, 
and then I can have a flux F. Flux is a vector, and B B V is a volumetric generation term. Okay? Volumetric generation term is B V, and we said we'll define three cases. In the first case. Ci, which is the ix uh, concentration of the ix species, and we'll have flux, convective flux and diffusive flux. Then we said we can also have some volumetric generation of species. This could be some from a reaction, for instance, and this is mole per meter cube per second. These are the units of Ri. Okay, so this is what we discussed. Then another type where I made a mistake, and I'll clarify why that was a mistake. Is the B in the case of, and also let's let's clarify. This is a conservation equation of what? Conservation of species. So we are conserving a species in this case, conservation of species. Okay. Then the second one, uh, there was a mistake. I wrote last time B only as temperature. That is incorrect. It should be rho CPT. And why it should be rho CPT is remember that temperature is a representation of energy in the system. It's not the entire energy. So we are writing conservation of energy in this case. So this is should be rho CPT. And remember. That rho CPT is enthalpy. In, in a way, it's volumetric enthalpy. Uh, so this has the units of mole per meter cube, and this is the units of joule per meter cube. Rho CPT. Okay. So uh, the CP is the heat capacity. And also note that when we write flux, convective flux, it is the B which gets multiplied with the velocity. Okay. So when you look at the column here, you can also see what the B should be, but because that's the value that gets multiplied with the velocity. That's another clue that B should be rho CPT. Uh, and then we discussed what heat generation. Uh, and as was suggested last time in the class, that heat could be generated using a reaction or some sort of electrical heating. So that is a heat generation part. And finally, we discussed total density rho. Remember, we discussed because we are using the mass average velocity, there will be no diffusive flux because if there are we are considering all the species combined, there is no diffusion. The diffusion was zero, so there was no second term here. The second term here, here was summation of ji, small ji, that would be zero, right? And we discussed that we cannot create mass. Mass cannot be generated or destroyed. And so that's why this is, and this is naturally the conservation of mass. So this equation is the conservation of mass. So an important table, keep it handy with you. Any questions about any of these terms? Here, units, anything that you would like to clarify? Yes, I think in the last lecture, you proposed a, a, a mini homework problem with a fourth. Correct. Um, uh, what, what was that again? Yeah, so great question. I will come to that once we derive it. I have a practice question on that, but great question. We'll discuss that in one second. Again, can I have a few minutes to discuss that? Any other questions? All right, okay, so let's discuss now. So we said, okay, these are the this is the scalar, this is the flux, this is the volumetric generation, and now let's let's discuss the derivation. So we started this, but I want to go through this again just to make sure you know you are all following. Uh, we said we'll de describe a control volume uh, in three dimensions x, y, and z. Uh, we'll have the control volume be a cuboidal. Okay, where we have. Uh, delta y, delta x, and delta z. Okay, uh, and the scalar b is coming in and going out. The scalar b could be one of the three, three cases we discussed. Uh, and we basically said we'll have we'll apply the equations in minus out plus generated is equal to accumulated. Right. Uh, and we said the way only way something can come in or come out from the from this box is through the surfaces, right? There is no other way. You have to define a surface for some scalar to come in and some scalar to go out. And on a surface, what you really care about is the flux because there is nothing else. There, there is there has to be a surface condition for something to enter or go out. So that's like a flux. So we defined six different kinds of fluxes. We said one could be let's use the right color. Let's say f of x here, and then f of x plus dx or delta x. Okay, something flux fx is coming in, uh, x plus delta x is going out, then fy is going from the bottom and 
coming in from the bottom, going out from the top, that y plus delta y. And then let's say the third color, let's pick blue. We say fz is coming in. And then fz plus delta z is going in this direction. Okay. And what is this? Uh, just remember that we are using fx, fx plus delta x because that is the flux that will matter on this on the on these surfaces, right? That on this surface here, it is really the perpendicular direction flux that matters. That is the only one that we can enter, right? If it's something parallel, I don't care. It's not going to cross the surface. So that's why I'm only using fx on the shaded region. I'm not using fy or fz because you know if it's parallel, it's not going to cross. I really care about in minus out. I don't care if it's going parallel. Okay. So just remember that as well. So now let's write uh, how we can calculate the total total uh, species coming in. Let's say from this shaded shaded surface, that's fx is coming in, right? And then fx plus delta x is going out. fx times the area, and the area is delta y delta z. Okay. Then going um, just to be consistent, let's do fx delta y delta z minus fx plus delta x delta y delta z okay this is in minus out on the on the x direction surfaces which is shaded with yellow here then let's do the y and then i'll shade them with gray okay uh, and for that um, let's write this down it'll be plus sorry um, plus f y delta x delta z minus f y plus delta y delta x delta z and then finally plus f z delta x delta y minus f z plus delta z delta x delta y okay so as you can see there is a pattern here coming in that whenever we add the coordinate x that gets multiplied with delta y delta z y it gets multiplied with the remaining two coordinates when i have a z it gets multiplied with the x delta y the third coordinate okay so it's clearly that makes sense because it's perpendicular to the surface which will have the area between the other two dimensions so this is in minus out so we have exhausted all the six surfaces we have the six terms now let's look at the generated term so what is generated we have been given a volumetric generation so we'll say plus bv delta x delta y delta z Okay, so that's what is being generated. And finally, accumulated. So accumulation means changing with time. What is changing with time inside the, inside the volume? So that's why we are saying del B by del T. This is the change with respect to time. And then again, delta X, delta Y, delta Z. Okay, any questions here? Any questions on any of the terms? Yeah, that might be confusing. Okay, so all the six surfaces for the fluxes, Volumetric generation multiplied with the volume to get the total generation, and then accumulation is changing in the quantity with respect to time multiplied with the volume. Okay. So that's basically what is the full derivation. And then what should we do next is to simplify. It's very obvious that we should divide by the volume because then we can cancel out the two terms and then we'll start to see a pattern coming in. So let's divide by the volume, divide by delta x, delta y, delta z. Okay. And I'll start to club the terms now. Uh, let me try to be consistent still. Fx minus Fx plus delta x by delta x plus Fy minus Fy plus delta y by delta y plus Fz minus fz plus delta z by delta z plus bv is equal to del b by del t. Okay, so this is what we get. You just divide by the volume and this is the, these are the three terms we get. And then we'll take limits of, because we want to write it at a point, take limits, delta x goes to zero, delta y goes to zero, delta z goes to zero. And I hope you can remember this now is this becomes minus del fx by del x, y by del y, minus del fc by del z, plus bv is equal to del b by del t, or in a vector form, we can say del b by del t uh, plus 
del dot f equal to pv. So I've taken this this term on the right hand side, this p term on the right hand side, and then I've written this in the vector form. This is the conservation equation. The most basic form of conservation equation. We are saying change in accumulation term plus a flux term is equal to this generated. Okay, that's how we. Are. Any questions here? Anything that's confusing? Right. Uh, so one thing I should note, and I've seen this, and hopefully mathematics course has clarified this for you, is that this is a divergence operator. A lot of times students tend to confuse the divergence and the gradient. Just remember a gradient in, gradient is applied on a scalar, a divergence is applied on a vector, right? It's a del dot f. It's not a del f. Okay. I have seen this over and over in exams and in the students. That means this is a divergence operator, del dot f. So if you're not familiar, I recommend you to just spend like 15 minutes just looking through divergence, and this is a divergence operator, not a gradient operator. Okay. So just make sure you're not confusing yourself and uh, kind of thinking of this as a uh, as a uh, uh, sort of a gradient okay so once you do that uh, then we have the full equation now let's try to take some cases of this so we have three different cases for the scalar b and flux f so let's start there uh, so what i'm right, trying to say is there are three cases right b a c i rho c p t and rho so let's start with this third case okay so now apply this third case uh, and then I'll start to write the equation. Okay, so case three. Case three is B is rho, flux is rho V and BV is zero, right? This is what we have discussed that there is no diffusive flux and there is no, gen there is no generation. And now if I substitute this, uh, I get del B by de uh, del rho by del T del rho by del t plus del dot rho v is equal to zero. Okay. And what is this equation called? Continuity equation, right? Do you remember this equation? You must have seen this in your courses. This is called continuity equation, which is conservation of mass. So instead of deriving it separately, we just substituted the values of v and we get the continuity equation, which uh, basically is conservation of mass in differential form. Continuity equation, conservation of mass or continuity equation. Okay. And I hope you can now remember you had seen this equation before. There is no diffusive flux for a reason because there is cannot be any diffusion for total density. Uh, and the right hand side is zero because we cannot produce any mass. Okay. Any questions on continuity equation? On continuity equation, all good. All right. And if rho is constant, if rho is constant, what will happen? What will happen if rho is constant? Will I have the first term, the rho by delta go, go, go to zero, right? And then rho can come out of the gradient operator because, oh, sorry, the dimension operator because we know it is constant. And so we can also drop it. If rho is constant, you simply get an even more familiar form that some of you might have seen is del dot v is zero. And that's when rho is constant. So, okay. So, when for liquids, everything when rho is constant, you can just use this. But for gases, when the density is changing, you can change the density is changing, you have to use that. Topic which I hope that makes sense. All good. All right. So with that, let's take a question on this. Uh, sorry, before I yeah, before I go into question, just a quick uh, note. Uh, so we are in now chapter two of Dean. I'll write this on my on my notes as well. So we are in chapter two of Dean. So this is a table taken from the Dean book. Uh, this is table two dash two, and what I'm just trying to show is you show that what we have derived is using the Cartesian coordinate or the rectangular coordinate that is in the top. That is how we derive the equation, but the vector form can also be converted into symmetric symmetric coordinates. Okay, you don't have to memorize it. All the exams will be open book, open computer, open laptops, and everything. So you don't have to memorize anything, but you should know that you can look up these formulas in book, right? And so just make sure you remember that it's a divergence operator again, not a gradient operator. And if you want to look at continuity equation, the basic tables have that. So table two dash two, you can just look up and see how the continuity equation is there for each and all systems. Okay. All right. All right. So let's go on and let's take first question for the class. 
uh, and this is basically the question that was just started. What happens to the fourth case? So now what I'm saying is, uh, is this equation valid? So we just saw the equation del rho by del t plus del dot rho v is equal to zero. Uh, and what I'm asking you is, is this question valid? And let's see, hopefully I can start the poll. It will take a few seconds to start, but hopefully it will. Yes, it should be on your screens now. Uh, so please respond, let's give it about a minute or so. So do you think it's valid? Uh, if it's not valid because the flux sum is incorrect, uh, or do you think it's not valid because the right hand side is not incorrect? And what, uh, what is your um, um, understanding? And um, do, do try to you know, think about what do you think is missing. We have eight responses. Um, again. I'll give another 15 seconds or so, so do get your responses in. All right, last few seconds, and then I'll close the poll. All right, perfect. So let's look at the results. So there is a split between A, B, and C. So please talk to your neighbor, convince what you wrote, what you chose, uh, and discuss what you think is the right answer, and then uh, let's talk more. Okay. So please talk to each other and discuss what's the what's the answer. All right. Okay. Let's uh, let's discuss. Uh, hopefully, your discussion was you know it was good to discuss with each other. So the correct answer is actually a C. So uh, it is because uh, it is not valid because of the generation term. That is the RHS is incorrect. Uh, I should also have had an option of B, which is where basically both terms are incorrect. But but, but it is actually the, the second term is correct in LHS, and let's discuss why that is. Uh, so. Uh, now, this is where your understanding of the, uh, the topic comes in is that if it's total concentration, I want to write fluxes and note that I have used molar velocity here as a basis. So always remember the basis that we have used here. I've used molar velocity as a basis, right? So I've used molar velocity as a basis. So my diffusive fluxes of, diffusive fluxes of all the species will also be on the molar basis, right? We have discussed that. And then we have, whenever, whenever we have diffusive fluxes on the molar basis, then J i of m would go to zero, right? We discussed that the small little J i will have go to zero when there is no m on, on the such superscript, and when we have capital J with this superscript, will go to zero. So the f term is actually correct. It is just convective. There is also no diffusion because we have chosen molar velocity as a basis. Now, if I give you the same example with a V instead of uh, instead of a VM, and I can no longer say that the sum of J's will be zero, right? Because we have discussed that the sum of capital J is not necessarily going to be zero, but the capital J with the superscript of M is going to be zero. Okay? So just remember that. And now the second, the th third part is volumetrically, can you generate moles or not? Of course you can, right? You can have changing in moles. You just cannot have a change in mass, but you can just generate moles. You can have a reaction where you can have like you know one species going into a couple of moles or three moles and so on. So moles are not necessarily conserved, right? Moles can basically be conserved or destroyed. Uh, and so how will you find them is the sum over all the species reactions, right? So if I know for each species what is the reaction rate, then I can sum all of them, and then I will know whether 
So it can be there that when that the no moles are generated or destroyed, but it doesn't have to be the case. Okay, I can have some generation of moles or I can destroy some moles. Okay. Any questions on this on this discussion? Anything that's confusing? Yes, please. Right. If there is no generation of moles, let's say if, uh, let's say there is this reaction. It's a degree process that's, that then you can have it uh, the on the right hand side, but it doesn't happen. Yeah. A special case, it could be valid. Like if I say uh, if I had the question in the way that is this true? Is this equation valid for systems with no reactions? Yes, it is valid. But if I, I can have a reaction, that is not a general enough equation, a special case. Any other questions? All right, okay. So now let's discuss case case two and one. So we discussed case three, which is B is equal to rho, F is equal to rho B and B is equal to zero. We did get the continuity equation. And let's go to case two. Sorry, case one, let's start with case one. Now my B is CI. B is CI, flux is CIV minus DI grad CI. I just want to remind you again, this is only true for constant row and constant row and pseudo binary. Okay. Uh, and BV is equal to R of I. Okay. So we have discussed this. This is the case one. This is what um, we have. And then so my equation will, will become del C I by del T, del C I by del T. This del dot CIV minus DI grad CI is equal to R. Okay. So this is basically I'm just using the equation um, just to clarify again in case I'm using this derived equation, the del dot F is equal to BV, which we derived today. I'm just substituting the values to get to this equation. Okay. All right. So now uh, there are some things that we can uh, do to simplify this equation further. One thing is note that we have a constant row. Okay, so this equation is only valid for a constant row, right? And what do we know about constant row? What will happen? We know like what is the special property when density is constant? It's written on the top, right? Del dot B is zero, right? If rho is constant, you just derive the cause of conservation of mass del dot B is zero. So what I will do is I'll skip a couple of mathematical steps. Is there in the supplementary information? I go through it very slowly. So don't worry, it's not something you are expected to like know all of these kinds of simplifications. But I would highly recommend to take just a little bit of time to see these steps. I just don't want to kind of, I want to focus more on discussion, but there are some couple of mathematical steps. So I'll I'll skip them here. I'll ask you to go through the supplementary video, which does discuss some of these mathematical steps in detail. Uh, and all what you will find is you'll get del i by del t v dot del and i'll discuss what this is v dot del c i is equal to d i del square c i plus r i okay and d i is the diffusivity which is constant that's that's how it comes out and what is this v dot del it's an operator which can be expanded to v x del v x by del x so, uh, sorry not um, v x v x del by del x plus Vy del by del Y plus Vz del by del Z. Okay. So this is what you operate on CI. So it becomes Vx del Ci by del X, Vy del Ci by del Y plus Vz del Ci by del Z. Okay. And I again recommend you to keep you can go through the derivation. It's not that difficult. It's a couple of steps. We use the condition that del dot V is zero. Uh, and we can simplify it to go to this form. And this is known as the species conservation equation. And some of you may have read about this as fixed second law, right? So this is species conservation equation or fixed second law. This is again an important equation for you to remember. Right? Any questions on this equation? 
So hopefully you can see this is the left hand side. One is the ancillary term, the accumulation term, this is the convection term, right hand side is the diffusion and the generation. Okay. These are the three uh, four terms in the equation. Now, can I use this equation for a binary system where density is changing? No, right? So what will we do in that case? We go back to the original equation, which is this equation. Okay, so I mean, again, this is, these are the things you may not have done in your undergrads or may not be as clear about is that this equation is true for a lot of cases, but not always. Will be. So if you have a gas diffusion problem where you will have density changing, you have you have to go back to the original equation that you have to define what the flux is and then solve the problem. We will do this problem in one of these examples in class. Okay, so we will become clear of what happens. And what are the changes you know, if you don't do it correctly? Any questions for this species conservation? Okay, good. All right. So let's keep moving. We'll have case three. Case three. So remember now B is this was a typo which I mentioned. This is rho CPT. Flux is convection rho CPT V minus K grad T. Then we'll have the BV is equal to heat generation HV. And if I write the full equation, I'll get del by rho CPT V, del by, del by del T of rho CPT plus del dot rho CPT V minus K grad T equal to HV. And again, in the supplementary information, I cover this supplementary information. Very supplementary video. I covered this, and what we use is we use the continuity equation, but now in its full form, we utilize this equation and we come up with the final equation that says del T by del T plus V dot del T is equal to K by rho CP del square T. del square t plus hv by rho cp okay. and just so that you all remember this is alpha on a thermal diffusivity and so this equation looks very similar to the equation for species diffusion the only difference being that i have to replace temperature c as a temperature the diffusivity has to be in alpha and the volumetric generation has been replaced by HV by the okay. So hopefully I can have them on the same. I can see them, them on top and bottom. It's the same equation. You just replace CI with T uh, and DI with alpha and RI with HV by OCP of the exact same setup. Okay. So whatever we will learn about heat, heat transfer can be applied to species diffusion if as long as it is constant through and through the binary. Okay. So there are a lot of similarities between the two equations, and that's why this topic is taught them together. Is that they're basically the same equation, just that you're replacing one with the other variable. And this is known as the conservation of energy. Yeah. Good question. I should have mentioned this. I forgot. This does assume that thermal conductivity is constant. So it assumes K is constant. Okay. If I have, let's say, a nice atomic material. Uh, so some of you may be working with, you know, sort of uh, materials that have special alignment. You know, some directions are more heat conductive than the other. In that case, K is not constant throughout the material. Okay. A metal in general would have a similar material, but if you're aligning the material, distancing the material, then you may have parallel direction of conductivity will be higher than the perpendicular one or something like that. In which case, K is not constant, you cannot not use this uh, formula. Uh, if some of you are interested, it is possible to mathematically handle such things. Basically, you represent your conductivity as a tensor. Or you basically can also have K as a function of temperature or something like that, depending on the material properties. But there are methods to do that. Uh, and she and I thought of uh, particular and I thought of it can be captured in these equations, just that we will not be covering in the course, but it is possible to be captured. 
very similar idea, just a little bit more mathematically involved. Any other questions here? All good. Okay. So now let's just finish our table. I'll copy paste the table from earlier and I'll just write all the equations here. Let's copy this. All right. So we discussed this. Uh, Um, I'll just try to clean this up a little bit. All right, so we discussed this table. And then now we have the equation. The equation is del ci by del t plus v dot del ci is equal to di del square ci plus ri. We have del t by del t is v dot del t uh, k by rho cp del square t plus hv by rho cp and then del rho by del t plus del dot rho v is equal to zero. We have the assumption of constant k here and constant rho and pseudo binary. So these are our equations. Uh, and again, all of them come from the master equation that we derived, del B by del T plus del dot F is equal to B. This is the master equation that we have. Any questions here? All good? All right. So let's take a five minute break. We'll come back at 12.47 and start, and then we'll start to discuss how to finish our set of equations. We use not a finished set of equations. We'll discuss that after the break. Uh, and then we'll continue. Okay. So after the break, we'll be, we'll have many questions for your eye clicker type questions. So you know and we'll have a lot of participation in the remainder of the all right. So let's resume at 1247.
All right, uh, twelve forty seven. So let's get started. Um, hopefully, you know uh, you're following along now. The course is starting to come together. So we started with the definition of fluxes. Then we started thinking about you know, different uh, kinds of you know uh, values like species conservation, uh, energy conservation, and total mass. We have the equations now. So what does this mean? Can I just solve them? Like I can solve them. I have equations. What does this mean? Conditions and boundary conditions, absolutely. So basically, that's the main missing element now, and that's what we will learn. I would say there are two parts which I will really emphasize throughout the course. Is that these are the equations, they are the most complex set of equations, most complete set of equations. Okay, so how to choose the right terms from within these equations, and then the second part, as we all pointed out, is the boundary conditions and the major conditions. Okay, so that's what we focus the next. Uh, and as you see, we'll try to combine, let me come back again and again. What is the governing equation or the boundary condition and then how to solve? So, great. So, let's start with thinking about how, what are the right boundary conditions and initial conditions. So, I'm not going to really cover much about initial conditions. That is literally the initial condition that will be given to you what happens at time t equal to zero. So, initial conditions are just basically specified values at t equal to zero so that's not that complex we'll be giving you okay you know assume the concentration is linear or concentration is constant or temperature is quadratic or something like that so that is something that is not you will not be solving necessarily at least in these sets of equations you will not be doing that but what you will definitely need to know and that is very important part of this course is boundary condition and boundary conditions make all the difference. Boundary conditions. Okay. So uh, one thing I should emphasize is where will we apply the initial conditions? What is, where do you think we should apply the initial conditions? Which region? That's the volume, right? We'll basically want to know everywhere, wherever, which is the, it basically will be specified in the entire region, the entire region will be given, let's say, uh, if I have a square system, I should know what is happening in the entire square. But what about boundary conditions? Boundary conditions are only allowed that apply that boundaries, right? So it is not throughout the region. It's only at the surface. So you need to know the surface to apply a boundary condition. So just remember that this is only applied at, only applied at boundaries. Only apply a boundaries. So let's imagine I have this as a boundary. So imagine this as a boundary surface. It can be arbitrary shape. And we have learned before how to find a normal to this boundary function, right? So remember that we had a we did a dummy dummy variable, did a gradient of that function by a mod of gradient to get the normal. Okay? We discussed that uh, a couple of times. So we'll have some normal. Okay. Uh, sorry, not n and hat, which is the unit vector of normal. Okay, so so you have a boundary, and now you want to apply the boundary condition. Typically, I would say we can break it down into three of different parts, or three different types of condition. Uh, and one is constant value, constant value. In which case, basically, you will be given what is the function, what is the value. You just we know. 
So again, remember we have a scalar D which can have three different parts: CI, rho CPT, or uh, or the uh, the third being the total density. So simply constant value, okay, this is what is constant. You can imagine this is very common. Actually, let's say we're exposing a water column to some sort of a gap, it's specialized, we have constant pressure outside, so we'll have a constant concentration inside. So you, you can have a very common case where you have a constant value. Easy enough, just know the value. You, you put that number there. Easy. Okay. So that's the easiest form of uh, boundary condition. Then we have a constant flux. Constant flux. Okay. So how do I calculate flux to a surface? So this is how do you calculate flux to a surface? Dot product with end cap, right? That's what we discussed. That if you know the flux Q, we had discussed with the thermal conductivity. If you know the flux Q, you can project it to the surface by doing a dot product with the end cap. So here simply simply you will say end cap dot f. Is some specified value f naught, which is a scalar, okay? scalar with a direction of n cap. Okay, so you'll be given, okay, well, if the flux is zero or flux is constant, and you'll be given a value, and then that is how you will. Just make sure your n cap direction is consistent, it's the same uh, for both the scalar and the, uh, and the flux curve. Okay. So, this is the second part, which is constant value, constant flux. What I'm not doing is the if you want if you're very particular about following everything systematically, you can create a table for three different cases as well. It's just copy pasting the value of B and F. I'm not doing it. The book does do that. So if you're interested, you can look up the book. Just to repeat in what is the value of B, what is the value of F, and so on. I'm just out of saving time, I'm not specifying three different cases, but note that we're discussing three cases, right? Concentration, energy, and total density. So all of these. So these are the two simple boundary conditions. The most important one, and I think that's the most critical one to understand and we will learn, is the third one, which is called like the interfacial boundary condition or inter, uh, interfacial boundary condition. Boundary condition. Okay. So this is just simply saying there is a boundary. I know the value and I know the flux. Okay. So those were the two ones. And now what is this interfacial boundary condition is saying that I'm actually interested in solving in both sides of the region. So what I implicitly did not say here is that I'm just solving, let's say in this yellow region that I'm shading now, that's my region of interest. I just want to solve on the left of this boundary. I'm not really solving on the right of this boundary because that's not something I'm interested in. I just don't care about the right hand side. That can happen. Let's say if something is constant outside, you just don't care. Like, let's say air water, you don't really maybe care about the air side. Okay. Or uh, maybe you care only about the air side, but not about the water side. So it's just one side of the interface. But in reality, and it's the most interesting and useful examples come when you have to solve on both sides of the interface. So the boundary is not an end of the overall region, but and it's kind of a separation between two different phases. And that's where the boundary condition becomes, this boundary condition becomes important. So let's now define this interface. So we have this interface, let's say, I'll have phase one marked by yellow. Okay, this phase one here. Again, this interface can have an arbitrary shape, phase one. And then let's pick a different color, let's say blue. Let's be dark here. Let's pick something like a gray. Phase two here, which is on the other side of the phase two. On the other side. Okay. So if you are a person like who likes to visualize what is this, you know, kind of abstract concept, think of it or air water interface. Simply this thing, air water interface is boundary representing sort of a shape of that. Okay. Um, that's all. So think of air water, something like that. All right. So the other thing uh, to note here is I'm defining something now an I hat. So this is the interface. This is the normal to the interface. And if you remember, I had told you earlier that as long as you're consistent, it doesn't matter what direction of and how to use here. It does matter what direction you use. So please make sure it's clear that and I had will go from phase one to phase two always. You can choose phase one to be the gray one and phase two to be the yellow one. As long as you choose phase one, just make sure that normal direction goes from phase one to phase two. Okay. 
so very very important always goes from goes from phase 1 to phase 2 phase 2 okay so it does matter in this formula which i write is what will happen for when it go from phase 1 what will what will it be part is the Okay, so this is one important normal direction of the integer. So pick a phase one, pick a phase two, just make the normal accordingly. And the answer won't change as long as you're consistently doing the uh, right, right step. Now, the second part, and this is the most tricky concept. And whenever I've taught this course, this is the most complex sort of uh, idea that comes, and students always struggle with it, is that we'll say there is a velocity of the interface. So that the interface can actually move. It's not going to be necessarily static. And students have asked me repeatedly. Now I've taught this a few times. And they're always asking, how can you have a velocity of an interface? And the best example I can give you, and you can think about it, is that let's imagine that there is a column of oil, or sorry, let's say acetone or something like that, in, 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 in air, and that, uh, that acetone is evaporated, right? So my air water interface is actually moving. So there is a velocity of that interface, and we will do an example of that. So it's not an abstract concept. In reality, an interface can also move, right? and even even when the interface is moving, it's possible that the velocity individually may be zero in both of it. Okay, having a velocity if something is moving doesn't necessarily mean that there is a net velocity on each side. Something is evaporating, going down slowly. Okay, so we'll discuss some of these concepts, and I'll try to clarify. How this makes sense, but the idea being that there can be a velocity in this, which is different than what is going on in the table. What is going on? They may be related, but they are not necessarily identical. The guy can be from the side, and the guy can have its own direction. Yeah, sure. So, with that in mind, now remember that I'm thinking about a field of B. It's again common to have this mistake. Let's imagine I have carbon dioxide in phase which is the air. And carbon dioxide is dissolved in phase one, which is the dissolved carbon dioxide. It's the same species, but when I will be writing the equation, in one case I'm solving phase two, and in one case I'm solving phase one. Okay, so I have two sets of conservation equations. I will be I will have if it is valid, if somehow I can have the pseudo binary assumption concept of valid, I'll have the top equation, one equation, sorry, one equation in phase two, one equation in phase one. Okay, so there'll be two equations. And then I'll be connecting them to this bond. Just remember that. And we'll discuss some of the examples. What I'm just trying to clarify is that when I say B or a value B, that can be either in phase one or phase two. And they may be different. They are not going to necessarily be the same. So the book goes to the derivation. I think that you can do the derivation, but I will give you the, the final result. Uh, and you know it's it's intuitive once you see it. So what is the final result? The final result is F minus B V I dotted with n in phase one with an i cap minus f minus b v i in phase two dotted with an i cap plus b s is equal to zero this is the interfacial balance condition interfacial balance condition okay so interfacial balance condition so there are there is a lot of things to uh, take care like kind of think about this is the surface generation surface generation and this is relative flux relative flux from phase one relative flux from phase two and basically if you want to think a little bit more physically this is in minus out plus generated equal to zero so the system is in the second term is out the third term is generated okay so this is another way to think about the balance in minus out is generated and there is no accumulation because accumulation requires a volume right accumulation had a volume now we're thinking of a surface the surface will not have accumulation in almost all cases, but there are some examples where we have it, but we'll not discuss it in this case. So this is the formula. This is a quite complex formula. It takes some practice to get used to it. Don't worry. We'll do another example. You will do it in your homework. 
to do it again and again throughout the course and get used to it. Okay. So what is going on here? What is this, you know, how, what is basically essentially the idea? The idea is there's some flux, some flux coming from phase one. First thing is note that the direction of Ni is important because Ni determines my in minus out. If my Ni is going from phase one to phase two, that's why the in is from phase one and out is from phase two, right? Because the way I've defined my Ni, right? If I do the Ni to be opposite, in will be from phase two and out will be from phase one, right? So that's why the direction of Ni was important. Let's note that. And why am I subtracting this BBI? The idea is that my interface is moving and I'm getting some flux. And I'm, what I'm really trying to get is the flux through the interface. So to subtract sort of a convective part from the interface. So that's sort of like when you do the full balance, you see it becomes a little bit more obvious. But this minus BBI comes when the interface is moving. If the interface is stationary, it doesn't matter. It's a drop it. It's simply a flux drop. But if the interface is moving, you have to also take into account that. Let's say if my flux is almost the same as the uh, moving of the interface, I'll not be able to cross anything. Then. So that's why it's sort of a relative flux with the interface for you one phase and then there is a generation. So can I generate something by surface? You can, right? You can have a surface reaction, you can have something uh, like a surface heat flux, you can be heating a surface or something like that. So that we can some surface. Heat. Okay, so this is basically what is very important. So we come in this formula again. Any questions about this formula? Anything that's confusing? So I know we didn't talk about this. Not necessary. Great question. So what the question is, does the velocity have to be normal to the, uh, or be parallel to the normal? The answer is not necessary. So the, it is, this is more general, but uh, you can imagine that when you take vi dot n, you will only care about the final normal velocity, but the velocity doesn't have to be much. That's not a necessary part. But at the end, that is the one that ends up much. Normal, normal. Absolutely, because if it doesn't move in this direction, I just care about the stuff in the car or any direction. So I don't have to subtract anything. Great question. Other questions? All right. Okay. So let's let's go further. So one final thing to note here. One final thing to note here is note about about uh, values across interface. Okay. So let's say if I have this here, phase one. Phase two, uh, then remember that at this point here and this here, right? Temperatures, I think green is not necessarily the best color here for projection. So it's one and two. The T1 is equal to T2. Okay. But the temperature, and this is a, uh, this is not almost like 100% of the movement. It's like some very specific cases that this is not valid, but you can assume a thermal equilibrium where temperature is basically the same. But the temperature will be continuous across the okay? So if I'm heating, let's say, uh, uh, two, 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 two solid blocks, like an iron and a copper, and, and, and they are joined, you cannot expect that the temperature will be different. It's just because temperature will be continuous. However, we cannot say the same thing about concentration. Okay, so if I have a concentration, I have one and two. It's not necessarily the same here and here. And how will we do that? This is basically called the partition coefficient. Right? You need a partition coefficient to relate concentrations on both sides. Okay, so K21 is basically going from index one to index two, uh, and you'll be given a partition coefficient. And can the concentrations have a jump? They can, right? So let's say if you have pure carbon dioxide. You are exposing it to water. Concentration is very high in the air. But as soon as you go into water, it is very low. It's dissolving in the water. Uh, if you want to relate pressure to concentration, it can be constant. You may remember from your other But mostly you use the partition. So you also need this condition along with the 
equation above to finally solve. Any questions here? Anything that's confusing? Because the rest, another 15 minutes is just, uh, just questions and uh, yeah, please. And the top, the top top. So you will need to have both of them to solve on along any other because you need two conditions because you're solving both the equations. You need two conditions. You need the second one. No, the good question. So diffusibility is completely separate. This is a thermodynamic function. So this partition coefficient is not related to the So you will be given the diffusibility to talk about it, you want to be two. But absolutely, this is just like a relationship that comes out of the thermodynamics and is not related to the equation. Yeah, so diffusibility can be different, but know that I will be two one if I write three one two. That means then I will say three one is three one two times. Okay. This one, another one. Any other questions? All right. So now let's take the next 15 minutes to just practice some questions and think about how we will utilize what we have learned and we'll do some, uh, you know, uh, practice and solve some questions together. So let's go to the next question here. All right. So uh, this is the question I think I've given in one of the exams earlier. Uh, in this course, and uh, so you can imagine this is the kind of you know, standard example here is that we are considering two stationary slabs with different heat flux on the side. So what can be computed based on the function provided? Okay, so you can either use this the intuition, but I would recommend try to use some of the things we discussed now. Either heat is being consumed, heat is being generated, heat is consumed, not generated, or that the situation is not even possible. So what do you think is going on in this problem? And I'll start the poll. And let's take about maybe a minute and a half or so to start. It should start. So take, let's take about a minute and a half to go through some of this. Five responses. Do try to physically uh, reason or mathematically reason. All right, another last, uh, let's do the last 15 seconds. Please do get in your answers. All right, we'll stop here and let's look at the results. All right, so it's being, it's pretty split as you can see, even the split uh, across A, B, and C, and some B also. So let's like, you know, please discuss. Uh, and then I'll reveal the answer. Please discuss and try to talk to people. Maybe you are not sitting next to, and just you know, you can uh, walk around also a little bit, and then we'll, we'll discuss. Okay. That's it. I have a question. Yes. Is there some sort of tangential balance that you can also write? No, we can. So I, I was wondering, just like, can it physically change from the x or two the axis? The direction? velocity. Then. So what governs that? 
you just there's no need i think you don't have to balance it so yeah you don't have to balance but why would it be different oh just to do, just imagine two different velocities moving right after slabs moving in the okay two different velocities yeah but in this case it's not related to the law or it can be it can be yeah i mean we haven't discussed it yeah we haven't discussed what it is yeah okay yeah other than that i think that sounds good All right. Uh, so let's discuss. Hopefully, some of the discussion was useful. Uh, so the answer is actually heat is being consumed, uh, and we will discuss how it is being consumed uh, in a second. Okay. So uh, so let's go here. So we have F minus B V I dot N I minus F minus B V I dot in the second place with B S. So now note my N is being pointing in this direction. It's E Y, right? So this has to be phase one. This has to be phase two. Okay. So this is being given to me. I've been told that these are stationary. So there is nothing. Interface is not moving, right? Because the problem says these are two stationary metallic slabs. Right? They are not moving. So if they are not moving, then I can say this goes to zero, and this goes to zero. Okay. So I have F one flux in phase one dot N I. Next flux in phase two dot n i plus b s is equal to zero. All right, and now uh, phase flux in phase one is given to be as e x plus two e y e x plus two e y dotted with e y minus f uh, x in phase two, which is two e x plus e y. Dot with e y plus b s is equal to zero, right? And then I get here e x dot e y is zero, so this is two minus one plus b s is zero, and b s is equal to minus one. When it's negative, b s is supposed to be generated now. When it's negative, it has to be which will be consuming. All right. So I know this is a math representation, and you'll be like, "Okay, fine, this, this makes sense." But you know what? Physically, how can you understand this? You know, this is not intuitive to me physically. So a simple way to think about this, let's go here, is that if I have a slab like this, so the first question is, "Is that really I care about the perpendicular direction?" Everybody was telling me that question before. That the flux should be balanced in the perpendicular direction. As you can see, flux to E Y is coming in the direction of slab. So I'm going the two two units in the E Y direction, but I'm only coming out one E Y in the slab too. So something has to be consumed. Otherwise, I should have this two E Y coming from the top as well. Something has to be consumed for this to happen. Now another question, and I would recommend this. This is a very common mistake I would say is that students have told me well. Your this is only true because your e y is in the positive direction. Normal is plus e y. If I take normal to be minus e y, I should expect it to be a different answer. And I wanted to try this at home. And you can always know. I wanted to try this at home. Is that uh, derive the same thing? So assume phase one to be this, phase two to be this, and assume n i to be minus e y, and show. That B S remains equal to minus one. Okay, it will be same. It doesn't matter. It's it still be the same. It's a very common misconception that if you change the normal direction, it will become positive. It will not. If it becomes positive, then our formula is wrong, right? It, I mean, physically, if something is being consumed, it has to be consumed in this factor of the direction. Okay. So if you don't get it, it is a different issue. To say. But just note, there are one and two directions are split down. Another way to think about it, and just want to kind of make sure I'm going again and again. That is that note that my e y direction has been specified to be positive e y. That is unchanged. My normal can be minus e y, but e y remains e y. The normal I can flip the normal direction, but y has to be positive, and that's why you will see this when we derive it. Is that it has to be positive. So the direction here in slab one is going upwards. Slab two is also going upwards with a slightly smaller value. Something is being consumed, and flipping the normal sign to minus e y is not going to make that difference. 
it has to be sequence. Okay, so try this at home. You get more convenience, and again, trying with variations makes you feel more comfortable about these formulas. And you will have again, yeah, please go ahead. So, what kind of variance would you have? Oh, great question. So, what is what? What should I change in this problem? Great question. That I, I should get. Any, any anybody wants to take this answer? Yes, so if I have a three UI, that's a four UI, then I'm basically saying I'm summing into what I am going to be more than that, something that's within it. Another good thing about this is that if I basically uh if my negative if I would work, if I have plus so yeah, if I work, if I would work opposite, I say minus two y and minus two three y. So when I keep it going in this direction, so if I get one, if it's stronger in magnitude, then I'm not going to Great, great questions, great discussion. Any other questions here? All right, so let's go further. Plus, uh, one more question before we wrap up the class, like two more questions here. So, so consider the stationary metallic glass with different refluxes on each side. What is the mathematical represented representation of the boundary condition at interface? Uh, and as you know, heat is being generated. Currently. Okay, so the, this time there is no heat being generated. What is the flux balance I should write? And this will be a quick question. I just want to make sure uh, you are kind of following the boundary condition. What are what is the boundary condition I should use? Uh, and normally, the UI. Okay. So what is the right kind of flux balance I should write? Uh, so this is a quick question. Just make sure you are following the boundary condition. Okay. So what is the right I'll give give it about a minute. Okay. Give it about a minute. So when you have uh, an inch of a long so it does it does it, 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 it has that that's a fluid condition. Yeah. So I'm saying it's a heat the flat is moving. Yeah, yeah. So I, I understand that uh, like conservation at a at the interface would be a normal condition. Yeah. And then that, that's not connected to the initial yeah. part. Yeah. But then if you also wrote like a conventional flux, so that's maybe think about that as well. Uh, when you write like something like the actual two y, then you also have like a conventional flux, and then uh, okay, that's the velocity. I think right, the velocity between the velocity of one side of the interface is the other side. That's uh, the velocity of the other side. That's okay. I'm just wondering if there are analogs that are like heat transfer. Oh, I see. Yeah, I, I have to think about it. Okay, right. we can come. Yeah, okay. yeah, good question. All right, maybe last five seconds. Please get your answers in. Uh, I'll close the uh, close it now. All right, and let's look at the results. So that's great. So most of you did get it to be C. Uh, so note that it's not a full gradient because I'm only looking at the normal direction again. The flux interest we are interested only in the normal direction, uh, and we need a conservation conservation because we're solving on two sides. Okay, so in homework two, not homework one. Homework two, you'll actually solve this problem in more depth, uh, and you'll you need both these conditions to solve it. So I'm not discussing in this too much detail because most of you did get it right. But if you're confused, don't again hesitate to reach out to me and I can you know explain this in more detail. But the correct answer is C here. Okay. So before we close, I just want to make sure I do get through this one last question here. Uh, and this, this is this, this question. So take your time uh, uh, and let's do this poll again. So this is uh, again a one day steady confidence system with no connection, there is no connection, pseudo binary. What are the governing equations of species A and B? When we think to describe the problem, there is a surface reaction going on, uh, A to B. Uh, uh, so A is being you know consumed, B is being generated. So what do you think uh, is the, the correct uh, conservation equation? All right. So let's uh, take about maybe another minute or so, and then I'll close the class. I, I, I will discuss this in more detail in this class. But I just want to make sure we have some results for this. All right. The four responses, maybe just take a guess if you're confused.
All right, last uh, 10 seconds just to get the results in. Uh, last, all right, let's close this and let's look at the results. So the correct answer is actually C. Uh, and that's why we will discuss it in the next class. All right. So, uh, so I'll see you. Uh, I'll see you on Wednesday, Day, which is September 7th. Uh, and have a good, have a good Labor Day weekend. Uh, and enjoy the break, you know, and we'll, we'll talk. Okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.